Sachsenhausen concentration camp is located in northeast Germany. It's about a 45 minute drive north of Berlin and about an hour's drive south of Ravensbrück concentration camp. In this aerial view of Sachsenhausen, you can appreciate its triangular shape. The parking lot is just off the screen down here, and then it's a short walk to the information building here. From the information building, we'll walk down this road on our way to the camp entrance. In the building to our right is an exhibition hall and a cafe. To the left down this short path is the Commandant's house. And then straight ahead is the entrance to the prisoner's camp. In this view, we're walking from the parking lot down this road. The information center is this yellow building just ahead. Now we've reached the end of the long road and are about to enter the campgrounds. The picture here on the right is of the Commandant's house. These photos are from inside the Commandant's house. To the right is a chair that was used in the house. To the left is a paperweight carved in the shape of an owl. This was made by one of the prisoners at the instruction of the Commandant. Across from the Commandant's house is a building that has a cafe and exhibition hall. To the left is a statue in the courtyard of the building, and to the right are stained glass windows as you enter the building. Sachsenhausen concentration camp was built in 1936. In the nine years it was in operation, over 200,000 prisoners passed through its gate. This building is known as Tower A. It consists of a watchtower above and the main gate to the prisoners camp below. The clock on top of the watchtower is permanently set to 1107 the time when Soviet troops liberated the camp on April 22, 1945. The phrase Arbeit macht frei, meaning work sets you free, is on the main gate to the camp. This phrase is often associated with the main gate at Auschwitz, but it was actually also used on several of the concentration camps. This view is after we pass through the main gate and turn to our right. In the distance are the remains of the camp prison and barracks 38 and 39. In the foreground is a concrete roller used to smooth roads which prisoners were made to pull. Next, we'll take a closer look at this brick wall to our right. This area was reconstructed in the 1960s to show what the security border looked like that lined the prisoner's camp. The gravel area is known as a death strip. Anyone found in this zone was shot without warning. If a prisoner tried to escape and got past the death strip, the next set of obstacles consisted of a cluster of barbed wire an electrified fence, and a brick wall. Past that long wall, 
we now find ourselves in the day room of prisoner barrack 39. To the right is the prisoner washroom in barrack 39. Next door to Barrack 39 is Barrack 38, seen here. To the left are the latrines, and to the right are the three-tiered bunks. If you look closely at the ceiling in the picture to the left, you can see damage that remains from an anti-Semitic arson attack in 1992. Near barracks 38 and 39, we'll pass through a gate and into the area of the camp prison. In the prison building, the walls are lined with prison cells. The prison building consisted of three wings of prison cells. Only one wing remains, which is the building we were just in. These are the foundations of where the other two wings were located. We've looked at the areas where the red stars are, and next we'll take a look at the yellow stars, starting with the shoe testing track then the site of the gallows, and then the prisoner's kitchen, which now houses an exhibition hall. With the shoe testing track, it follows a semicircular path, and we'll take a closer look at that on the next slide. From this view, you can see the main watchtower, and then the large roll call square, and then these long rectangular strips that kind of fan out and those are the locations where the barracks once stood. So you can see from the guard tower, they could see all across the camp. Here are some closer views of the shoe testing track. The track consisted of various surfaces, cement, gravel, mud, cobblestone, etc. Since leather was in shorter supply during the war, the Nazis wanted to test out alternative materials for the soles of boots. And you can kind of see how there are squares blocked out with the different surfaces. Here again, you can see the different surfaces along the track. Prisoners assigned to this unit wore a 25-pound rucksack and were made to walk continuously around the track all day, often walking more than 20 miles per day. Every five to six miles, the soles were inspected for wear and tear. In the photo on the left, we are at the back of the roll call square looking towards the main gate. If we turn around 180 degrees, we have the view that's on the right. The marker on the ground mentions that this is the site of the gallows, where prisoners were hung in full view of all of those in the roll call square. The building ahead and to the right is the prisoner's kitchen, which now houses camp artifacts and is where We'll head next. These are a few of the artifacts now housed in the prisoner's kitchen. To the left is a harmonica that belonged to a prisoner. To the right is a songbook written and illustrated by some of the prisoners. This is a whipping trestle and was used as a form of punishment. Prisoners were made to remove their shirts and they would stand over here to the right with their ankles locked in. They would then lean over this structure, stretching their arms out in front of them. Once in position, the Nazi guards would start whipping the prisoners across the back. 
some of the Nazis were so evil that they would even have prisoners whip other prisoners. This is a wheelbarrow for corpses that is on display. The information card reads, prisoners assigned to the corpse bearer detail had to collect dead bodies from the prisoner's barracks and bring them into the cellar of the pathology building where the corpses were kept. This wheelbarrow was then used to bring the dead to the crematoria. This is actually a pretty extraordinary piece on display. The information card reads, shoe and flowers made of bread. Ludwig Peters was given this decoration as a present by a young Russian fellow prisoner. The 16-year-old, who died shortly afterwards from tuberculosis, had put aside part of his meager bread ration and had molded these flowers from it. This gesture came from the heart. It was the most beautiful present of my life, recalled Peters in 1960. One of the display cases had this. It's a mold used in the manufacturing of gas masks. This photo on the left is a cold storage room in the kitchen where perishable foods were kept and meats were hung from these hooks above. The picture in the upper right is a large basin used for washing potatoes. The bottom right picture is in the cellar of the kitchen building, and you can see the potato basin there in the distance. On the walls in the cellar of the kitchen, are the remains of several paintings done by prisoners during various periods during the camp's existence. In this case are the remains of a harmonica, a tuning fork, and a tuning mechanism of a guitar. On the next slide, we'll exit the kitchen building and take a 360 degree view of the camp. From the kitchen, we'll move down here to the Sachsenhausen National Memorial, and then over to the Soviet Special Camp Museum, and then over to this area where there is the execution wall and Station Z. This is the Sachsenhausen National Memorial that was built in 1961. This is dedicated primarily to the political prisoners of Sachsenhausen. You may recall that prisoners at camps were made to wear triangular patches. The color of the patch signified how the prisoner was classified. Political prisoners wore red triangular patches, as are reflected on this monument. Near the back of the camp is the Soviet Special Camp Museum, seen to the left, and to the right, some of the original Soviet barracks. Also in this area are mass graves and a memorial for victims of the special camp.
The photo to the left is a guard tower near the Soviet special camp. Across the camp, near the execution trench, is a camp wall. The wall traces the history of murder and mass murder in the camp. Behind the camp wall, near the execution trench, is a burial ground, which you can see in this rectangular plot that contains the ashes of some of the victims of Sachsenhausen. This area is known as the execution trench, where prisoners were taken to be shot. Next to it is an area known as Station Z, which we'll look at on the next slide. From this view, the execution trench is to our left. This white structure to our right contains the remains of Station Z. Here's the front of the area known as Station Z. It contains the remains of a small gas chamber, a crematorium, and prisoner killing rooms. On a wall at the entrance of Station Z is a quote by a Sachsenhausen survivor, which reads, and I know one thing more, that the Europe of the future cannot exist without commemorating all those, regardless of their nationality, who were killed at that time with complete contempt and hate, who were tortured to death, starved, gassed, incinerated, and hanged. Nearby is a statue in memory of the victims of Sachsenhausen. On this billboard, you can see the execution trench here in the foreground. The white building that we were just looking at now covers the foundation of this structure. This card reads, the construction of Station Z took from December 1941 until May 1942. The stone building built in an L shape contained an extermination area with gas chamber and neck shot facility, as well as a crematoria. From the outside, their position is given away by the high chimney. This was also clearly visible from the inmate camp and from neighboring residential areas. On this billboard, we'll use the text to the left and the map in conjunction with one another. So basically, the inmates that were selected for murder entered this corridor, number three, and into the undressing room, which was number four. From here, they were either led into the small gas chamber, which is number two, or over here, which was the doctor's room in number seven. Their SS personnel dressed in white coats examined the inmates and marked those who had gold teeth or fillings. In this room, there was also a gramophone on which loud music was played. We'll see in just a minute that that loud music was to uh, mask the sounds of gunshots. An SS man led one inmate at a time through the antechamber and into the actual execution room. So they were led through here, through here, and to number 13. There would be an SS man with a rifle in this room, number 14, and there was a slit in the wall. So there was the measuring rod, which also had a slit in it, up against this wall, and the inmate would stand with her back against it 
and the SS men would fire the rifle through the slit into the back of the neck of the inmate, killing him. From there, inmates would take the corpse into room 17, the mortuary, and there the gold teeth were pulled out of the corpses if they had been marked. So let's go back to the camp museum and look at what one of those measuring rods looks like. Um, it's similar to what you might find in a doctor's office today to measure one's height. Unlike the ones in doctor's offices, these used in Sachsenhausen had a sinister design. You can see there's a slit that runs the length of the rod. So in that execution room, these were mounted on the wall so that it hid the slit that was in the wall. When a prisoner was brought in, they stood with their backs against this rod, thinking that they were there to have their height measured. Instead, that Nazi was standing behind the wall, would fire a bullet through the slit and into the back of the neck of the prisoner, killing him. Here we can actually see what remains of the foundation today. So this was the corridor that they would pass through to get to this area, the undressing room. You can see this small area was where a gas chamber was. And then over here, this is where the doctor's room was. So if we look at the map on the bottom uh, in room seven, that's the doctor's room. And remember from here, they were led through the antechamber to number 13, and that was the execution room. The SS guard with the rifle would be in 14 and then fire the bullet through the slit in the wall. So now if we go up here and just follow the highlighter, this is part of room seven, the doctor's room. So the inmate would be led through the antechamber and into this area which corresponds to number 13. So this was the execution room. Behind would have been the uh, room, which is number 14, where the Nazi guard with the rifle was located. And then this larger area, which here's a, a broader picture, and you can see this large open area, uh, number 17, which is where the mortuary is. And then over here to the far right, we will have the uh, crematoria area. So on this slide, you can get an idea of the crematoria area and the furnaces that remain. So as we exit back into the main area of the camp, there's this long wall and partway down that wall, there is a slit that you can look through. And when you look through that slit, you can see the remains of the first crematorium at Sachsenhausen, which you can see over here. So where this yellow star is, uh, that's the area that had the slit in the wall that we looked through to see the remains of the first crematorium. So next we'll move down to these two long buildings, which are the infirmary barracks, and then to this third yellow star, which is the pathology building that has a cellar mortuary. Here are the two infirmary barracks. At the far end, in the middle, you can see the main watchtower, which is where we entered the camp. In one of the infirmary barracks, a sign reads, Ward number 53, internal medicine section. 
In the internal medicine section, there were, in addition to several sick rooms, a treatment and dressing room, an orderly room where medicines were kept, and a washroom with two bathtubs and a room with several toilets. These are some items found in the camp pharmacy after liberation. And some additional items that were once in the camp pharmacy. Soviet POWs made this chess game whose pieces are made of bread. It was presented as a gift to Franz Cyrenek. Cyrenek was an electrician who was made to install and operate the x-ray machines in the infirmary. The exposure to radiation left him with burns on both hands. In the infirmary barrack, we have to the left remains of the kitchen and to the right remains of the bathing room. This is the pathology building near the infirmary and in its basement is the mortuary cellar. In the pathology building is a sign which states, in 1941, Dr. Leva came to Sachsenhausen from Buchenwald camp to take charge of the pathology department. Being a camp senior, I was told that block seniors had to report inmates with unusual tattoos. This report was passed on to the roll call leader. Eventually, each of the tattooed inmates was ordered to come to the sick bay. Soon after, we'd receive a death notice. Several times I went to the pathology department while Dr. Leve wasn't there and in his room saw pieces of skin and body parts with these tattoos, which were kept in jars of alcohol lining the walls. In the drawers, too, prepared sections of skin were kept. I have held such sections of skin in my own hand. And that was by one of the former camp seniors. And here is the main pathology room where autopsies and dissections took place. On the left are stairs leading to the underground mortuary cellar, which is seen on the right, where corpses were stored. A few notable prisoners at Sachsenhausen that you might be interested in reading more about are the following. The first is Johann George Elser, and he made a homemade bomb in 1939 that missed killing Hitler and many of his high-ranking SS members by only 13 minutes. Another is Herschel Greenspan, and he assassinated Ernst von Rott in November 1938. Uh, this action led to what is now known as Kristallnacht, where the Nazis retaliated by destroying Jewish businesses and synagogues, in addition to arresting 30,000 Jewish men and sending them to various concentration camps, including Sachsenhausen. Another is Yakov Jugashvili, who was Joseph Stalin's eldest son um, and died at Sachsenhausen. The details are still kind of unclear, but it's believed that he was shot as he was running into the electrified fence. And the fourth, uh, Martin Niemöller, who was a minister and also a camp survivor. Initially, he was a supporter of Hitler and also a supporter of anti-Semitism. 
his views dramatically changed after his seven-year imprisonment and at the end of the war. Uh, he became an advocate for peace and is the author of a famous quote which begins, first they came. There are actually several versions of Niemöller's famous quote. The one that's most common and is the one that's on display at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me.